So what I'm going to tell you briefly about is the nature of aortic coarctation, discuss the role of the arterial duct, and emphasize the associated malformations, although I shall wait to talk about the associated malformations until I've introduced interruption of the aortic arch. So if we look at the coarctation lesion, there are three types. The coarctation lesion can take the form of a shelf within the lumen of the aorta, or the walls of the aorta itself can be folded in so that we have what we call the waist lesion. And the third type of coarctation is where the entirety of the aortic arch is narrowed either the transverse arch or the isthmus, and that is known as tubular hypoplasia. So pictures being worth thousands of words, this is the waist lesion, and there you see an example of a very nice waist lesion producing aortic coarctation. You see that the walls of the aorta at the junction between the isthmus, the duct, and the descending aorta are folded in, producing a waste in the arterial pathways. This is the essence of the shelf lesion. There is now no infolding of the wall between the isthmus and the descending aorta, but rather there is a diaphragmatic shelf within the lumen and oftentimes, this is the pattern that is associated with a ligamentous rather than a patent arterial duct. And this is the type of picture that you see in older patients. And here is a resected segment taken out by the surgeon showing you the shelf inside the arterial pathway. And then the third type, tubular hypoplasia. And so what you are seeing here is the ascending aorta, which is dividing into the brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and then between the left common carotid artery and the pathway from the pulmonary trunk through the duct to the descending aorta, you see tubular hypoplasia of the aortic arch. And you also note the subclavian artery is distal to the union from duct to the descending aorta. Now the obstructive lesion can vary in its relationship to the mouth of the arterial duct. And so we describe this either as being preductal, when the major flow pathway through the arterial duct is to the descending aorta, paraductal, when the obstructive lesion, usually a waste lesion, is open, is opposite to the mouth of the open duct, or postductal, when the flow pathway is from the patent arterial duct to the isthmus of the aorta. In fact, this pattern, in my experience, is exceedingly rare. And in most instances where you see post-ductal coarctation described, in reality, the duct is ligamentous. And to my mind, when the duct is ligamentous, all bets should be off, because you can't judge the relationship of the coarctation to a closed duct. The other point to note is that all three of these patterns are juxtaductal. They are in the environs of the duct. So to me, Describing coarctation as being juxtaductal tells you nothing. What the clinician needs to know, what the surgeon needs to know, is it preductal, is it paraductal, or is it postductal? All of which tells you that the arterial duct is crucially important in the etiology and the location of aortic coarctation because. The shelf lesion itself, we know from histologic studies, initially was ductal tissue. And therefore, shelf lesions arguably are not suitable for dilation when seen with a patent arterial duct. 
because obstruction almost certainly will recur. The situation is quite different when the arterial duct is closed and the shelf is seen in an older patient. So the difference we are talking about is the normal situation where when we look at the extent of ductal tissue, which is shown in yellow, it extends part way beyond the margins of the union of the duct and the flow pathway made of isthmus and descending aorta. Compare that to the situation seen in coarctation, where now the ductal tissue lassoes the mouth of the isthmus and gives you the potential for narrowing significantly the isthmus when the duct itself closes. So the ductal, the coarctation lesion itself is made of ductal tissue. We can then draw a direct line from aortic coarctation to interruption of the aortic arch. Because when we look at autopsy specimens, we can see a spectrum of malformation. And that spectrum leads through, first of all, coarctation to atresia of the aortic arch to interruption of the aortic arch. That spectrum is best seen at the isthmus, but we can also see it in the transverse arch when there is origin of the subclavian artery beyond the site of interruption. So we also need to take note of the site of interruption and when describing interruption of the arch, we need to note that there can be different ventricular arterial connections, although I'm not going to emphasize that. What I'm going to show you is the site of interruption and then move on to the associated malformations, which are more or less the same in coarctation as they are in interruption. So when we describe interruption of the aortic arch, classically we describe it as type A, type B, and type C. And this is another of those problems, is that I always forget whether type A is interruption of the isthmus or whether it's interruption between the brachiocephalic and the right common carotid artery. I have no trouble with type B because that's the one in the middle. So my own preference is rather than using an alpha, an alphabetic classification is to describe interruption at the isthmus, when as you see, the arterial duct then will simply feed the descending aorta. Interruption between the left common carotid and the left subclavian artery, when the isthmus then feeds both the left subclavian artery and the descending aorta. Those are the common types of interruption. The rarest type of interruption between the carotid arteries themselves and then the duct feeds first the left common carotid artery, then the left subclavian artery, and then the descending aorta. You need to be wary when making these diagnoses to take into account retroesophageal origin of the subclavian artery. But other than the retroesophageal origin of the subclavian artery, which is a crucially imported, important associated lesions, lesion, and as was stated by Richard Van Prague, the essence of understanding these malformations is that all the woe lies below. So what we have to look for within the heart is those lesions which reduce aortic flow. And they can be a ventricular septal defect, a restrictive infundibulum as seen in discordant or double outlet ventricular arterial connections, or as we have discussed, a restrictive ventricular septal defect when there is univentricular connection to a dominant left ventricle. And then again, do not forget the retroesophageal subclavian artery. But these are the key lesions that you find either in interruption of the aortic arch or severe aortic coarctation. I'm showing you two parasternal long axis equivalents. And to your left hand, you're seeing posterior deviation of the muscular outlet septum, which is blocking the subaortic sub outflow tract and narrowing the aorta. To your right hand, 
you are seeing the equivalent in a doubly committed and juxta arterial ventricular septal defect when it is the fibrous raphe between the pulmonary and aortic valves that is deviated posteriorly, but with the same result, blocking the flow pathways to the aorta.